Aside from that time they decided to show us how to pronounce their name correctly, Porsche. Perhaps the most important thing Porsche ever did was make the 356. When an automotive manufacturer is able to maintain an iconic design language, whether it's BMW or Ferrari or even Chevrolet, there's a reason that style has come to be, and though it's always an evolution for these companies, often you can point to one great and truly innovative car in the company's history that brought about this trend. Perhaps no other brand has a more iconic and recognizable design language than Porsche. In Grant Larson's foreword to Gordon Maltby's incredible book on the 356, one that I've used as a resource for this video, and it's linked below if you guys want to learn more. He points out that the Porsche 356 is that car. It's the car that everything kind of points back to. And even if you've never looked too far back into Porsche's history and really only seen their current crop of sports cars out on the road, one look at the company's first production vehicle, the 356, and it all makes sense despite being a design that is now some 70 years old. The roots of Porsche's first production car, in terms of form and function, actually starts with an initiative from Hitler to make an everyman's car, which was the Volkswagen. And prior to turning his company into a full-blown production car manufacturer, Ferdinand Porsche was heavily involved in the design of the Volkswagen Beetle. And it's pretty interesting once you make this connection, and it's great ammo if you ever want to make fun of Porsche guys, but if you take a slug bug and you lightly smash it, don't totally smash it, just a little bit, kind of looks like a Porsche. There's much in common between the Beetle and the 356 because that car would sort of be the bare bones and the structure that Porsche used to create their sports car. And it may appear as though the company's first endeavor into making its own production car much later in 1948 was a really hard turn towards performance, you know, a far cry from the Beetle, but actually there were quite a few concept and prototypes, essentially sport wagons, Volkswagen Beetles turned into kind of sporting cars, and those concepts and designs would really influence Porsche's first car. Now, after the war and after a long business building for the Nazi war machine, it was time for Porsche to do something new. When you look at automotive history, there's often a clear connection between post-war struggles and the emergence of the greatest and most successful car companies and motorcycle manufacturers, from Honda to Vespa to Porsche. After essentially saving Porsche by taking the company to Austria, Ferry, that is Ferdinand Porsche's son, started dreaming of the first production Porsche. Now these were wild times for the company and family, including ongoing imprisonment of many of Porsche's higher-ups, including old Ferdinand himself. And just building a complete sports car from scratch isn't always possible, especially when funds aren't readily available. So after an attempt at building a Formula One Grand Prix car, Porsche decided that the simplest and most affordable path forward would be to make that concept of a sporting VW a reality. And this is very similar to the story of, for example, how Tesla went about building up their production cars. Enter the Type 356-01. Now despite this prototype essentially just being a source of income for Porsche and not at all representative of their entire capabilities as a company in terms of engineering, to many this was a marvel. Powered by a rear-positioned modified VW Beetle engine and featuring an aerodynamic, very smooth body, this car would lay the foundation for the later production 356 and for Porsches going forward. It was thoroughly sport-oriented, and even in these very early stages, it even had a bit of success in racing. While much of the world was raving about this new concept roadster, Porsche was hard at work to make it better in the form of a coupe. In Gordon Maltby's book, he points out Ferry's ideas behind the styling. Ferry says that, The whole concept was the product of my own technical feeling. For example, I prefer an open-wheeled race car in which the driver can see exactly where he is putting his front wheels, Obviously in production cars, the open wheel concept would not work. I compromised by designing the front fenders in such a manner that although the whole assembly was in one unit, the driver would still have a good idea of where his front wheels were. We gave the Porsche's front fenders a shape of their own, making them quite distinctive from that of the hood. Now these early 356s were all produced in Gemund, Austria, and these are known as the 356 Pre-A. Now the 356's first major appearance was at the 1949 Geneva Auto Show. Though the car wasn't available for mass production, this was one of those pivotal moments in the company's history as the car received fantastic response from pretty much everybody who saw it. 
Under rather primitive conditions, Porsche slowly built up production while simultaneously focusing on their engineering prowess, consistently getting new patents related to engine and chassis design. Now at this point, the VW engine was being tuned to get upwards of about 40 horsepower. Which might not sound like a lot, but at this point the standard 1131cc VW air-cooled flat 4 was only getting about 25 horsepower. Porsche was able to get this performance through larger carbs, higher compression pistons and heads, angled exhaust ports. In the 356, the engine revved freer, and through development it continued to make more and more power, and slowly over time would kind of become its own engine, separate from pretty much anything VW was making. At this point though, Porsche wasn't really making money, they were just slowly hand building a few cars at a time. Ultimately, it would be the production of a Porsche tractor that would enable them to get the credit needed to take the 356 production to the next level as the company moved back to their home in Germany and partnered with a coach builder called Reuters. Now Reuters would work with Porsche all the way up through the mid 60s. And also at this point, the company was forced to move from making aluminum body cars to press steel for production reasons. As the company pushed to ramp up production and get the car in front of sporting enthusiasts worldwide, especially in the United States, Porsche decided to develop a logo, or really an emblem, kind of a badge, whatever you want to call it. The 356 would be the first Porsche product to bear this badge right on the steering wheel center button, and this was meant to echo state and city emblems for the company, with of course also a bit of a nod to Ferrari with the horse logo from a few years before. As sales and production grew for the 356 coupe, power numbers really didn't impress most people, so the company decided, like so many, to go racing to prove that their light, aerodynamic product could compete with the best in its class, and at this time, there was no better place in Europe to get eyes on your sports car than the 24 hours of Le Mans. With just a few months before Le Mans, Porsche decided to take four leftover aluminum body cars, some of which didn't actually end up making it to the racetrack, and paired to a highly tuned 46 horsepower engine capable of 100 plus miles per hour, in the end the little coupe won both the 1100 and 1500 cc class. And this was a huge moment for the company, as it would set a standard for racing and even record breaking going forward. Building race cars would prove beneficial beyond just recognition, and Ferry Porsche knew this from the get-go. The lessons that would be learned in developing lightweight, more powerful cars would bring about changes to the production in really meaningful ways. Win on Sunday, sell on Monday isn't everything. When you win on Sunday, you just learn how to make better cars. And all of this development would bring about the introduction of a 1300 and 1500 and even bigger versions of the 356. Now at this point in the early 50s, the VW engines were so reworked that, like I said, very little of the original was left and Porsche was able to push out upwards of 70 horsepower out of the 1500. Now as the 50s carried on, more affordable, high-performance sports cars were becoming available, and those were targeted directly at Porsche's primary market, which was the United States. The 356 was quite expensive. By the mid-50s, you could have the new Healy 100 for about 2900 bucks, while the cheapest 356 was around 3500 Porsche's American importer Max Hoffman, ever in tune with the American market, wanted Porsche to create a new version of the 356 that was competition ready for the growing racing scene and he wanted it to cost $3,000. And he even had a name ready, the Speedster. Now Ferry Porsche wasn't exactly excited about this idea. At this time, going up market seemed to be the best route for the company, and it's important to understand that Porsches at this point were complete cars with everything available. They weren't exactly playing the game of upgrades. You just kind of got the whole package when you bought one of their cars. But the higher-ups reluctantly gave in and chose to trust Hoffman's advice, and he assured them that California buyers wouldn't care if the car didn't have all of the goodies. You know, a heater, for example, wasn't really necessary, and they could save money by making the car simpler. And so a new, simple, redesigned, sleek body in top-down form with more basic interior and about a 100-pound weight reduction over the coupe, the car came in at $29.95. Well, sort of. You couldn't actually buy it at that price. You had to get some of the extras, but it still looked good. And also with the $500 optional 1500S roller crank engine, it made upwards of 70 horsepower. Now, it wasn't the fastest or most powerful car in the world, but it handled really well, and many chose it over the British Roadsters for racing and 
They were also just more reliable. Now this was just the beginning for the company and for their sporting prowess. In 1955, the company began putting their four overhead cam race engine in their production cars, and that engine was capable of producing 110 horsepower first brought to a model that shared virtually everything in looks with the regular 356s, but now with the small words Carrera in gold on the fenders. Named after their famous class wins in Mexico, this was a full-blown race engine in a car, and Carrera would really come to mean race in Porsche's ongoing model development. It was with this car that Porsche began to kind of pull ahead of everybody, not just in production, but also in racing. And this was 1955, and here was a car that drove and handled and performed like a sports car from decades later. And with this car, Porsche would also set a precedent for companies going forward to bring their racing technology directly to the street. Over time, the 356 would prove to be a long, successful experiment in evolution and constant improvements, which isn't possible if the original setup isn't kind of timelessly good. But in this case, it would prove to be exactly that for all of Porsche's history, even till today. And very few companies can lay claim to a heritage like this, and it's really a testament to how brilliant Ferdinand Porsche Sr. and Jr. really were. Technically speaking, there were six sort of generations of the 356, but if you laid those models out in a row, I think a lot of non-enthusiasts would struggle to really see any major differences, even though this car existed for almost 20 years. And that's because, in terms of aesthetics, differences to the car were minimal. And this really gets at not just the heart of what Porsche was doing with this model, but what Porsche has always strived to do as a company. It's not about making something flashy, it's about making something that works. And so there's less focus on adding, you know, trendy bits to make your car appeal to the masses, and just more focus on making a car that really performs well. Car and Driver's October of 1963 review of the Porsche 356 Coupe starts by addressing its hefty price. During the process of its evolution, the Porsche has become a different automobile and a more costly one. But it is an incomparable car in the literal sense. There's nothing like it at any price. That review goes on to essentially prop up the Porsche as the best handling car that money can buy. They say a large measure of the car's excellent controllability is due to the command the driver has over his machine. The pedal relationship is faultless, inviting you to heel tow it into a lower gear than you probably need. The sense you get from contemporary Porsche reviews as the 356 continued to evolve is that Porsche's attention to detail in terms specifically of the mechanics and the engineering was beginning to set these cars apart from really everything else available. And that expensive price tag, sure it would eventually be about status for some people, but for those really in touch with sport motoring, they knew what they were buying, and it was the best driver's car in the world. The results were clear. Through its lifetime from 1948 through 1965, Porsche sold some 76,000 units across all models. Everything Porsche did to improve the 356 over its lifetime built the company up as an engineering force in the automotive world both on the racing and production side. They proved to be a company that just never settled. They never thought to rest on their laurels, at least for most of their cars. Perhaps the standout feature of the 356 over all of its competitors was its reliability. Very few sports cars like this existed that could be taken out and thrashed through the twisties or on the track, and then, you know, you could just take it to work the next day. I mean, you could do this for other cars, but you kind of needed to be at least somewhat of a mechanic, especially if you were driving something British. But not so with the 356. It was incredibly reliable and sturdy. It was just German engineering at its finest. Having a sports car that was reliable in many ways wasn't really a thing at this time, and in some ways the 356 was the first of its kind in that regard. And because of this, the best British roadsters were those that were simple, and this was needed because you as a layman needed to be able to work on the thing. Porsche's greatest cars, from the 901 to the 911, they all owe their identity to this car, the 356. This car and the struggles faced by Porsche through its development and production are kind of like a mini history of Porsche till today. Porsche's legacy, starting with this car, is marked by a relentless pursuit of excellence in engineering and a commitment to producing high-performance sports cars that have achieved success on both the road and the racetrack. It's nearly impossible to overstate the influence Porsche has had on the automotive industry. 
No matter what you may think of Porsche cars, or more likely those who drive them, there's no denying that the company's identity has been and is one of innovation and forward thinking with very little concern for trends. Since the very beginning, thanks to the endless creativity and ingenuity of the Porsche family, the company has always strove to really push boundaries amidst constant struggles. When your goal is to make a car that puts the driver and the driver's experience first, and you're really damn smart, it's hard to fail and it simplifies your business model. You don't need to constantly try to impress people with BS marketing or fake new models that aren't really new. No, you can just keep making a car that looks essentially the same for decades at a time with constant little improvements. You can focus your money and your time on the stuff that actually counts, and you can just let your car's performance speak for themselves. You don't have to constantly be trying to tell everybody to buy your car. People just know it's the best, and that's the way it is with Porsche. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know if you've ever driven an old Porsche, whether it was a 356 or a 901. We would love to hear your stories in the comments below, and make sure to subscribe if you liked this video and check out my other videos on stories from automotive history. All right, we'll see you guys in the next video. Drive safe.